Well, it's that time of year again, or t- time of the week again. Where time we, of the month again. <laughs> where we uh, <laughs> get together and discuss our favorite topic in the whole world, which is... Horror. Horror! Well, horror films, yes. Yes. <laughs> and I'm Ron McClellan. And I'm Kevin Powers. And this is Conversations in Horror. So, uh, this week, we decided to take apart the films of one of our favorite directors, which is John Carpenter. Yay! (laughs) Uh, Most famous for his film, uh, Halloween, but he's done so much for the horror genre and created so many horror and sci-fi films. He has. Starting with, of course, Halloween. So... Uh, we'll start with uh, Halloween, and we'll kind of uh, break down what our favorite moments are and uh, what we think is important about the movies. So, um, with Halloween, I, I know it's one of your favorites of all time. It used to be one of my favorites until I saw it five billion times, uh, and so now it's a little bit lower on my list of favorite John Carpenter films. Well, you know he did a Godzilla movie, too. Gorgo versus Godzilla in 1969, probably a... Student film. I know it was a student film. Never saw it. It's probably horrible, but at the same time, it was probably awesome. <laughs> I wish I could find it. That would be awesome to see that movie. It would be on IMDb or YouTube if you could find it. Yeah, I doubt that's going to happen. But, okay, we'll go back to Halloween, 1978. Jamie Lee Curtis. Who played in several of uh, Carpenter's films. Right, The Fog and... Halloween 2, that John didn't really direct, but he did direct. <laughs> but he did produce it. <laughs> and he directed a lot of it. Well, the thing about Halloween that I still enjoy the most is the boogeyman aspects of it. Right. Uh, that which was lost in the second film when it became a straightforward slasher. But I like the boogeyman aspect and the fact that Donald Pleasant has always been one of my favorite actors. He can't kill the boogeyman. Well, my favorite part of Halloween is the almost non-existence of blood. And... Totally relying on suspense to scare the audience. And it worked. It worked really well. I agree with you. Uh, one of the great things about John Carpenter's films, uh, this one especially, is this fact that he's really good at suspense, at building suspense. Oh, look. Look where? Behind the bush. I don't see anything. Can you drop by so fast that when you yelled at? Subtle, isn't it? Him and Wes Craven are two of my favorites for that one specific reason, is that they know how to build suspense and to put the audience on the edge of their seat. Well, it wasn't until summer of 79 that it rolled around to this side of the country, the East Coast, where at least here in Georgia. I saw it at the drive-in theater <laughs> in 1979. And the first night I saw it was by myself, and it scared the hell out of me. It really did scare the hell out of me, especially in a car. And there's only like six cars in the whole place because it was a Thursday night. <laughs> I mean, that just scared the hell out of me. So I brought a girlfriend of mine back with me, knowing it would scare the hell out of her. And it did. And ever since then, it's probably been one, one of my, if not my favorite horror films of all time. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to see it in a drive-in, unfortunately. I ended up seeing the first three on VHS video when my parents decided to rent them. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So uh, I don't have my memory of the Halloween films. Don't go back as far. <laughs> you know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? Yeah, I know. I'm old. I'm antiquated. I'm vintage. But, you know, it was. it's really cool now looking back, knowing that, hey, oh, by the way, I'm eating gummy bears. Um, knowing that, hey, I saw the movie just months after it was released and, it really was as scary as everybody said it was back then. There are just so many aspects of the movie that stick out in my mind. You know, with Michael Myers and the, the whole how he just kind of lurks around the neighborhood stalking these girls all day long. Annie, was that you? Of course. Why didn't you say anything? You scared me to death. I had my mouth full. Couldn't you hear me? thought it was an obscene phone call. Now you hear obscene chewing. Um, without any, even killing anyone, that in itself was just uber creepy to me mm-hmm. and then when it finally goes down at night it made it you know all the more better yeah well the uh, build yeah exactly the slow burn was really well done yep and uh you know halloween changed the face of uh horror films from uh, then on and made uh john carpenter a household name 
Exactly. And it ushered in what we call the slasher era. The very same year he did a TV movie called Someone's Watching Me that scared the babysitter. Yeah, I saw it once a long time ago. It was a uh, TV movie, so you couldn't say much about it. But Yeah, you know, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, John Carpenter during his TV years, because he did se- several films for television during that time period before he went on to his next feature, real feature film. And John did have his hands in the making of Halloween 2 II and 3, um, even though Rick Rosenthal did 2 and Tommy Lee Wallace did 3. John was producer, and I think he actually directed some of part two. You couldn't have shot him six times. You think I'm lying, Sheriff? I think you missed him. No man could take six slugs. I told you this isn't a man. And then, let's see, 1981, he did Escape from New York. It wasn't really a horror film. No, but it also has Adrian Barbeau, which yeah. is one of my favorite actors. Oh, wait a minute, we forgot. We got to back up a year. We forgot The Fog. John Carpenter's The Fog. Stevie Wayne here, and let me be the first to wish Antonio Bay a happy birthday. Which was a host of character actors. Jamie Lee Curtis, Adrian Barbeau, Tom Atkins, Tom Atkins Hal Holbrook, uh, even Jamie's mom got in on Vivian the fun. Lee. Vivian Lee, yeah. Yep, a lot of different uh, icons were in that film. And it, it had uh, state-of-the-art special effects at the time with them trying to control the fog, practically, which had never been done before. Yeah, and on a scale like they were doing it as well outdoors and it was pretty tough it really was they didn't really have cgi to make fog back then so they had to really make fog and that was a lot of damn fog some of those movies back in the day with the old practical effects you know they just have that feel that it's hard to get with cgi i mean being a a person who grew up with movies that use practical effects it's kind of unless they're really good cgi it's hard for me to take it serious and that brings us to 1982 and John Carpenter's, really his first sci-fi horror film, the remake of The Thing. Well, really it's not a remake, it's the actual interpretation of the novel. Yeah. Really- but it is one of my favorite, uh, if not my favorite, John Carpenter film. What the hell's in there? It's weird and pissed off, whatever it is. Bennings, go get child. And for those of you who have not seen it, shame on you, shame on you, it is basically about a team that goes that is are stationed in the arctic and but in this case i think it's antarctica and the original is the arctic it's the north pole we finally got one we found a flying saucer in the remake of john carpenter's it's antarctica so they go down there and they find this norwegian base that's been decimated and everybody dead and they bring this alien virus back with them after they find a ship that's been dug out of the, the ice, or alien virus back with them, which is a replicant virus. It, it looks, it takes, I guess, DNA from its host and looks like them, so it can look like anybody in camp, so it's kind of a body snatchers kind of thing. <laughs> but it's got Kurt Russell, and he uses a flamethrower, and that's just A plus B equals awesome. Mac wants the flamethrower. Mac wants the what? That's what he said, now move! Well, the great thing is the special effects, uh, which are all practical, and uh, were done by who? Robo Team. Robo Team. Uh, who also did the the special effects for The Howling, among uh, many other great horror films. Um, but the like I said, the reason why this film resonates even today is because of the practical effects and how realistic they still look, unlike the prequel. The modern day prequel in which everything was CGI and was not as well received with audiences. Nah. I mean, it was okay. It's hard for me to swallow. Plus, they changed a lot of stuff. They did the whole replicant thing again, but they changed some stuff. And they, they tried really hard to make McCready look like Kurt Russell. <laughs> I think. <laughs> a little too hard. All right, so that takes us to 1983. And John Carpenter's Christine. Christine. John Stockwell, however, he went on to be in a lot of movies. Top Gun, quite a few. His father was Dean Stockwell from or the show, the TV show. Uh, Quantum Leap. Quantum Leap, yeah. The guy's boss, I guess you might call him. That was his Dean's father, son. yeah. Was his boss. John is his son. And the effects, once again, the effects of that car putting itself back together after it gets just demolished was ridiculous good. 
Okay. Show me. I mean, it didn't even look fake. It looked real. And I don't know how they did that, but it impressed me. Well, the most impressive thing about the Christine is the fact that they used a lot of the the music of the era to, uh, you know, enhance the film itself, which is one of the things that was also in the novel by Stephen King. So, you know, John Carpenter pulled out a lot of great things from the novel to uh, appeal to the audiences of the film. So that was good. Actually, uh, Stephen King said it was one of his favorite movie adaptations of his books. <laughs> so then, then John went on to do a couple of non-horror films, Starman with Jeff Bridges and Big Trouble in Little China once again with Kurt Russell. And then he went on to do Prince of Darkness. And it's funny, so many people hear the name Prince of Darkness and they all think it's a vampire movie when it's about the devil. <laughs> it's not about a vampire at all. Yeah. Quantum Mechanics and the Devil, which are two things that usually mix what they do in this movie. Very well they do in this movie. And a little bit of time travel. If you uh, look closely or close, closer at the film, a lot of time travel actually too. And the dreamscape and how that affects you as well. So that movie had a lot of stuff going for it that was beyond <laughs> what audiences were expecting before at the time. It's time. It was a movie before its time. It really was. And it, it it was kind of a sleeper in the time, too, because not a lot of people heard about it. Not a lot of people saw it. It got popular later on in more of a cult following. Well, most of Carpenter's films have been that way. He has not had very many hits uh, when they originally come out, but they, a lot of them have or a, a, a huge cult following. That's right. Uh, one of my favorite, though, speaking of cult movies, is his 88 film, They Live, with... Rowdy Roddy Piper, that movie, it was a uh, breed of its own, you might say. Yeah, <laughs> it was his next science fiction film, horror film, where aliens that once again look like us inhabit the earth, and they have all these subliminal messages, and there are these glasses which were produced by a human faction against these aliens, and when you wore the glasses, you could see the aliens, what they really look like, and... Rowdy Roddy Piper plays an out-of-work grifter who happens to get in with a bunch of these uh, people who are against or trying to get the word out that the aliens exist. And it leads to one of the greatest fight scenes ever filmed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one of the longest for, this time, for a very long time, one of the longest fight scenes. Between him and, once again, from The Thing, Keith David. Yep. Well, John Carpenter was very famous for uh, reusing a lot of his fa uh, his favorite actors. Yes, he was. Film, I mean, so. Jamie Lee Curtis, Tom Atkins, Keith David, Kurt Russell, Adrian Barbeau, the list goes on. Charles Cyphers. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots that he would just roll them right on in and use them again. Yeah, but that was something a lot of great directors decided to use if... You have a great actor who's capable of playing multiple different types of roles. You bring them back. And you keep bringing them back. <laughs> They're people you can trust. And They Live was the first time I had ever seen the lady with the beautiful eyes, Meg Foster. Mm. And uh, fell in love with her from the word go. Who's played in a lot of films, but most recently in uh, Rob Zombie's uh, The Lords of Salem. Right. And didn't she play Evil Lynn in... Master of the Masters Universe. Masters of the Universe, I thought so. She got around in the 80s. She did get around in the 80s. Another movie, 92, which I personally have never seen. I've been wanting to see it. Never got to see it. I'm sure Kevin has. His Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Ah, the Chevy Chase movie. Yep, and I always wanted to see that. It's not really a horror film. It's a comedy film, but I it's really wanted to see it. Sci-fi comedy, yeah. Never got to see it. Want to see it. Got to see it. One day I will. It's uh, more of an espionage sci-fi thriller. Chevy Chase trying to downplay comedy in the film with Daryl Hannah and Sam Neill before he became really famous. Uh, so um, one of the great things about that is because uh, you know John Carpenter was also you know doing special effects that no one else had been attempted before, mostly with the building that's half there and half not there. That, they made a big deal of that when the film came out, and uh, you know Chevy Chase trying to change his image from being an 
strictly comedies to doing lots of sci-fi and uh, working with John Carpenter. Uh, audiences didn't really take to it so well, and it's got a small cult following. Very small. <laughs> that, but that doesn't mean it's not a good movie. It's yeah. actually a really good movie, and you know, based on a really good play. So, uh, not a play, but a, a book. So. Then the next year, he did another TV movie, Body Bags. I remember that. I remember watching that on, on uh, WTCG Channel 17 here in Atlanta. And Body Bags came on. I think it was 17 it was on. I'm not sure. It might have been one of the network channels. It was a Showtime original movie. It was supposed that to be what it a, was? It was, a, it was supposed to be a pilot for a new anthology series. It didn't work out so well. And it was an anthology in itself. Well, yeah, because you saw the first three episodes of what was supposed to be the show. I think one was a hair transplant that went wrong, and another the last was one was Stacey like a Keats. baseball. Yeah, last last one was about a baseball player with uh, so Mr. Star Wars himself. Oh, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill, yeah, yes. Yeah, he was in it. And then the other one was uh, with uh, Robert Ke- Robert Carradine. Uh, uh, Robert Carradine from Revenge of the Nerds. Um, so yeah, Robert Carradine. Uh, and Tom Arnold was the morgue worker in the first one too. So, uh, but you know that was one of the only roles in which John Carpenter played uh, acted in it. And you know that uh, Wes Craven and Sam Raimi both showed up in it and did yeah. a little cameo in Body Bags. Yep. And David Naughton from American Werewolf in London, he had a little role in it as well. You know that was co-directed by uh, Toby Hooper too, right? Oh, was it really? Yeah, he That's did awesome. one of the stories. John Carpenter did two of them. Toby Hooper did one of them. Oh, that's interesting. And then we go to the insurance investigator movie, In the Mouth of Madness. Which is one of my all-time favorite John Carpenter films. It's a films. great movie. It's got Sam Neill in it. It's that right there. Just I love Sam Neill. It, it, I think it got 7.2 rating on IMDb. It's really a good movie. Well, when it came out, it tanked at the box office, unfortunately, because most audiences didn't get Lovecraft uh, back then. They wanted something a little bit more straightforward and In the Mouth of Madness is a very cerebral horror film in which the monsters are really left to your imagination for the most part. Well, the bad guy was one of my favorite German actors, uh, Jürgen Prochnow, who was the he was in the movie uh, Das Boot. Mm-hmm. And he was also in um, the Hitler movie The Bunker. Mm. He's a he's a re- he's a great German actor. He really is. He's been in several things. He's been been showing up in horror movies a lot recently too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a personally a big fan of Julie Carmen, uh, so <laughs> I still watch it just because I love to watch Julie Carmen, just like I love Fright Night Part Two, which is a more infamous film. Well, that's some cool people. I mean, Charlton Heston was even in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so was uh, David Warner, who was in uh, Star Trek: The Undiscovered Country. Uh, John Glover from S- Gremlins 2 and Smallville. Yep. We had a lot of people with that movie, uh, which has gotten a much bigger cult following since its original release, which it was just buried. Buried. Buried in the ground. And then there comes The Village of the Damned. Which came out right after In the Mouth of Madness, and unfortunately, absolutely no one uh, saw the remake of Village of the Damned. Uh, because it was not a very well-regarded film, and it was not one of John Carpenter's strongest films. But Superman was in it. Christopher Reeve. Christopher Reeve Reeve was in it. So was uh, Mark Hamill. And Kirstie Alley. Kirstie Alley was in it. And Michael Perret. Yep. From uh, The Philadelphia Experiment. Yep. And uh, Trevor Trove of Huey Bowles films now. (laughs) (laughs) Right. <laughs> but Village of the Damned was it was good. It, I don't know if it was a remake of the original or if it was just a reimagining of the original. It's the exact same movie. But I think it was pretty much a, just a remake of it. But it was really good. I liked it. I liked it because once again they had good effects. All John Carpenter movies. You see a John Carpenter movie, you can bet your ass the effects at least will be really good because he don't play with no bad effects. <laughs> Then in 1996, he went back to the Escape films and did, once again, with Kurt Russell. And this time, with uh, Kurt Russell and Peter Fonda, Peter Fonda and they did Escape from Los Angeles. Also, again, had Pam Greer, Stacey Keach. 
a lot of his mainstay actors uh, returned for his, I think, probably his highest budget of film was Escape from L.A. Unfortunately, it also was not real received and tanked at the box office, but it's not uncommon for that to happen to a John Carpenter films. No, uh, because they, then they do just do awesome on DVD or now. Yeah. On demand. <laughs> Most people love the character of Snake Plissken, uh, which is why he survived for as long as he has. Now, I will, I will have to say that <laughs> the surfing scene was a little over the top, and the CGI was just horrible. I, was, I think that's the first time John Carpenter really used CGI it was in that movie. I can't think of any movie before that that really had blatant CGI in it, but that was blatant CGI. And it was, I don't know if he meant for it to look cheesy and terrible, but it certainly did. When that hat went down, I was like, yeah, I just hate it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Didn't like that. Vampires. James Wood, 1988. James Woods, I'm sorry. 1988. Daniel Baldwin. Remember Vampires? Did you yes, see Vampires? Yes, I saw Vampires. I enjoyed... And it had Max Me and Shell. That's who I really like. No. Uh, it had Thomas Ian Griffith as the vampire. Yeah. And uh, my favorite, uh, Cheryl Lee, as uh, the, the female lead. So... Um, I I have seen it only several times. I think James Wood does a phenomenal job uh, and lets him chew the scenery like no other film has, <laughs> not right. since Videodrome. Um, <laughs> but I'm not a big vampire fan, so that one is, does not hold a very high position with me. But, you know, if we were doing James Wood's films, it would. Then in 2001, John backpedaled again, did another science fiction horror film called Ghost of Mars. That's yeah, got Jason, Jason Statham. That's probably Jason Statham's first movie. Uh, <laughs> Natasha Henstridge and Ice Cube. Pam Greer's in it. Yep. <laughs> there was a movie in the 60s called Angry Red Planet. Yes, there was, and I've never seen it. <laughs> Ghost of Mars had Ice Cube. I remember that. Yeah. and uh, It Natasha... was a weird movie. I didn't really... It's been a long time since I've seen it. Well, it is Assault and Precinct 13 in space is what yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It really is. Um, that's what it was designed as. That's what it is when you walk into it. And um, it does achieve a, a, a great deal of uh, sci-fi and horror, and it mixes it really well. And it has a strong leads with you know Natasha Henstridge, who was coming off of uh, her famous Species series, and Ice Cube, who was uh, making waves in multiple different films, uh, trying to erase the fact that you know people only thought of him at the time as a rapper, right, instead of an actor. So, and then John's latest and greatest creation, which is now five years old, 2010, The Ward, which is probably my least favorite John Carpenter movie. <laughs> Sorry, I actually enjoy The Ward because of Amber Heard. I liked she, it because the atmosphere was good, but the story was kind of convoluted. I don't know. Amber Amber Heard did a, a phenomenal job, uh, especially coming off of a film that sat on the shelf for several years before being released. Because I like Cigarette Burns better than The Ward. And yeah, it was a short, but still. I like Cigarette Burns better than The Ward. He did that five years prior. Well, you also got to remember that The Ward was not a film that John Carpenter originally cr created or produced. The script came to him, and he liked it enough that he produced it. I mean, or he directed it. So, and then it, it was written by two brothers, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. The, what are their names? The Rasmussen brothers? So, I mean, that's uh, Carpenter coming across a script that he loved and he decided to do it. It allowed him to get back to a smaller budget film in which he can control a lot of the elements, which he does because that movie is built on suspense. And, um, which well, I mean, he... with the exception of Amber Heard, there's basically no big names in it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, none. It was like him going back to Halloween where there were no names in his film. He produced a lot of remakes in that time of his films, such as... Uh, the Assault on Precinct 13 remake, the Fog remake. He had a hand in all those. Um, but he just couldn't get his own film off the ground, and which is what's plaguing him now. You know, With Masters of Horror, that allowed him to have complete control over what he did, and their Cigarette Barons and his other one, I can't remember his other uh, Masters of Horror episode, which is Pro-Life, are two of the most well-regarded of the uh, Masters of Horror episodes. So, what do you think about John Carpenter's oeuvre? About John Carpenter's what? Zubra? Oeuvre. Oeuvre. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what that means. 
<laughs> overall output of things. Oh, oeuvre. I just learned oeuvre means overall output of things. <laughs> he made 28 films, and I liked them all but two. So I think that's pretty good. <laughs> well, we did skip over all the sci-fi films and non well, yeah. sci-fi films. Well, yeah. We touched a couple of sci-fi horror films, but <laughs> we did his 28 main films, including a couple of his shorts or TV films. Now, the but th- the only ones I really didn't just go, ooh, that was awesome, was The Ward and uh, Vampires. I just wasn't a big fan of Vampires. Oh, Vampires, you know, was also another big cult film. In fact, it spawned two uh, sequels that he had nothing to do with, but, you know, they kept the franchise alive. It did keep the franchise alive. So, um, you know... It, John Carpenter's had a profound effect on the genre in that he has maintained the status of doing films and subjects that other directors aren't doing. You know, he's tackled everything from Stephen King material with, with Christine, H.P. Lovecraft with In the Mouth of Madness, doing remakes like Village of the Damned and The Thing. I would and, like to see a lot more H.P. Lovecraft things come down the pike. I really would. Or at least takes on H.P. Lovecraft stories because he did some really cool stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. You don't see enough of it. <laughs> well, with that being said, John Carpenter is still my favorite director as far as horror films go. Well, you do know he's currently doing working in the comic book medium, right? Oh, really? He's a comic guy now, huh? Yep. His comic book, Asylum, is uh, currently still running. Uh, but you know, it allows him more freedom, uh, to do what he wants without having the budget constraints. Right. So, well, with that being said, I guess that will put a cap on this edition of conversations in horror. And we hope that you've enjoyed our talk about the horror films of John Carpenter and that you go out there and watch some of these excellent films. Uh, the ones that you have seen, Rewatch them, and the ones you haven't seen, well, we hope that you uh, go out there and seek them out. I'm Hi. Kevin Powers. I'm Ron McClellan. And this has been Conversation in Horror. Conversation in Horror is produced by Ron McClellan and Kevin L. Powers. The views of this program are not the views of Broken Lighthouse Pictures. Conversation in Horror is copyright 2015 Broken Lighthouse Pictures. All rights reserved.